Bonjour, welcome. Uh, bienvenue à la vie de Paquette. Very happy that you're all here today, so thanks very much for coming. Uh, je, je ne parle pas beaucoup de français, so most of the talk will be in English. I hope you weren't tricked by the title. Um, for those English speakers, I'm sure that uh, that's reassuring. <laughs> so, welcome. Um, so, I kind of have an ambitious amount of material, so I think I'll just try to, try to run through it, and then we can do questions and answers at the end. So, I'll start just with an introduction more to set the groundwork on network virtualization overlays. Then I'll talk about MiroNet as an example of a distributed architecture and some of the benefits that we have with using a, a distributed architecture. Then we'll go into la vie d'un paquet, so the life of a packet as it goes through an OpenStack and MiroNet environment. Uh, next, we'll do sous de la capo, just a little under the hood, a little more nitty gritty, a little more deep dive into what's happening on the uh, underlay and, and on the host level. Then I'll do a few use cases just to talk about some of the advantages that we do get when we have a distributed architecture and some of the differentiators we have um, compared to some other solutions and alternative uh, architectures. And finally, I'll talk about uh, distributed software, and we'll get to that when we, when we get there. <laughs> so network virtualization overlays. I thought I would start a little bit uh, further back. Um, personally, my background is more on the hardware networking side. So those in infrastructure are kind of familiar with this type of architecture, a three-tier architecture sort of designed to aggregate, push packets along. Um, it was architected at a time where we didn't have as many virtualization uh, work, vir virtualized workloads, that is. So as, uh, as network design kind of modified and adapted to the, the network, uh, the, the virtualized workloads, we kind of did ad hoc things to sort of adapt to the, the needs of, of virtualization. So we started making large layer two broadcast domains, you know, sacrificed some of the stability there, um, dealt with reconvergence and spanning tree, um, started developing hardware protocols like OpenFlow that have a longer product life cycle to get implemented and implemented in hardware and agreed upon from a standards perspective. Uh, then of course, we kind of forced particular network architectures depending on the type of functions we needed, like load balancers, um, firewalls, of course, uh, and, and wanting them to be um, deployed in an HA manner, um, deploying them in pairs. Of course, this forces traffic trombones in the network. And um, so th with all these functions, we still need to, to implement, let's say, um, layer two switching and routing, load balancing, firewalls, NATs. These are still functions we require in the network, but how can we do that um, with a, a new design, let's say? We can still leverage the old infrastructure, but we can, make it, we can implement these things in a much simpler manner. So this is where we can try to consolidate these functions and try to do it in software. So what we can do is we build a network virtualization overlay and we get much more agile networking. So we can build larger clouds, we can um, build logical topologies, and be prepared for a virtualized environment. And we can do this in what we call a single virtual network hop. So what's cool is we can apply all those network functions that we saw previously implemented through hardware appliances, or even virtualized appliances, but now we can do it in a single virtual hop and implement this through a logical topology. So some examples of uh, overlays are one type of architecture is the centralized controller model. So what we have here is a centralized intelligence. So we might have a controller that's making all the routing decisions or other network function decisions, and it's all housed at the, at the controller. So as we start getting going, we start adding compute power. Uh, we start spinning up more VMs and we start taxing the controller a little bit more. Um, as we, when we built out the network initially, we probably allotted or tried to estimate the type of scale we wanted to build within the processing power at the centralized controller. Um, but what happens is you could end up overloading and facing different types of failures in that manner um, just based on what you may have tried to estimate the, the network growing to. 
So some of the advantages with distributed architectures are we can achieve all the network functionality, including those routing decisions and other network type functions in a single virtual hop. Other, other things that are beneficial are no single point of failure, whether that be a, a, cl a cluster of control nodes or, um, or basically particular appliances within the network. So distributed architectures are specifically made to be built out, uh, scaled out for the cloud. So the more, the more processing power, the more compute nodes you add, the more processing power you get. What we also see with network virtualization overlays is we totally simplify the underlay. So this, is, this means you can leverage your existing infrastructure and existing routing protocols, for example, as long as these agents or this, the intelligence um, at the edge is reachable uh, over IP connectivity. What we also get with that network virtualization overlay is not just virtualizing uh, network appliances, but we actually virtualize a logical network topology. So what that means is we can actually easily manipulate, create, delete, um, and build these networks as clouds demand, as our tenants demand, as our users demand, um, and everything's ready to go. So we get that rapid creation and modification of a virtual network. And so part of the beauty of that edge intelligence is we can add functionality and push it to the edge and easily implement without the reliance on hardware or networking or specific hardware protocols that would be required for our, our change with SDN. All right, so let's be agile at the edge. Let's take the plunge. Let's decouple ourselves from the physical network. So MitoNet is a, is a product that was created by MitoKura, um, of which I'm a systems engineer, um, and it is an example of a distributed architecture. So the MitoNet uh, is a network virtualization overlay, and it's a product that implements layer two logical switching, layer three routing, NAT, stateful and stateless NAT, that is, distributed firewalls, logical layer four load balancing. We implement that with VXLAN or GRE tunneling as our overlay technology. And uh, we work with OpenStack Neutron's API. So we're basically a Neutron plugin. And uh, we've been involved with OpenStack since the B release. And from day one, we've implemented a distributed architecture. So high availability, uh, built ready to scale out for clouds and OpenStack. So looking more at our distributed architecture, this uh, diagram depicts the components of our architecture. So as you can see here, our agent resides on each of the hosts, and um, it's interfacing with, with the kernel and uh, VMs that are spun up. As you can see in the center, all that's required on the underlay is layer three connectivity. So you can use your existing layer three infrastructure, for example, and build a stable underlay without large broadcast domains and do all the networking um, at the edge. Here we also see a network state database. So this is just a passive database of where we store uh, the logical topologies for each of the tenants and it, within OpenStack. So the cloud orchestrator could represent something like OpenStack to interact and create and modify networks. Below we have our BGP gateway. So this is just our gateway in and out of the network. So this can be anything from a layer three gateway using BGP to scale out, uh, which we'll get into more in our use case scenarios, um, or layer three static routing, or a layer two gateway. So th these are just ways to terminate uh, the VXLAN tunneling or GRE tunneling and get in and out of the network. So let's, uh, let's talk about the La Vida en Paquet in an OpenStack and Midona environment. So first we'll just do a light stroll just to, to get the landscape and understand the Midonet's environment so you can see how a packet traverses um, using this network virtualization overlay technology. So as we know, cloud computing can be complicated. As we mentioned, you know, we were trying to do a lot of things on the underlay network to account for virtualized workloads and building clouds on top of. 
So building this OpenStack and Metonet environments, um, as you can see here, we can, on the left-hand side, upper left-hand side, we just store basically our logical topologies in our network state database. On the upper right-hand side, we're representing our gateway nodes. So these could be the BGP gateway nodes on which the Metonet agent resides. And since we try to minimize the requirements of the underlay, so just being as agnostic as possible for the hardware, basically the, the gateway nodes are our agent residing on x86 boxes. And then we can install our Metonet agent on all of the servers below. And all that's required between everything is IP connectivity, so it makes it pretty simple for your requirements on your underlay. So now as a tenant, let's build a, a virtual network. So Metonets provides this functionality called a provider router. So basically from an operator's perspective or a tenant's perspective, it's access to the external network um, for, let's say, any of the tenant's networks on which you can basically um, configure uplinks. So this is automatically created once you create an external network within OpenStack. And then each tenant can build its own tenant router, as you guys are probably familiar with. We do, we're doing the tenant isolation. So each tenant can build its own router, define its own uh, network, and assign particular subnets. Each tenant obviously has its choice to implement security groups, so we do that all in a distributed fashion. So they can define those security group rules. And also NAT as well. So once those are created, we can spin up two VMs on the, on the network. So here they get their .2 and .3 address. So as I mentioned earlier, the network state database is basically just a passive database storing all of the logical topologies. So everything that we may have built through OpenStack would be stored in some entity form in this passive database. So now let's make, these, uh, let's make these VMs talk to each other. Let's pass some packets. So what happens? On the first uh, inbound or outbound packet, this VM um, basically sends its packet to the, the kernel. And that Metonet agent basically intercepts the packet. Since it's not known, if it's the very first packet it's, and it's not cached locally, the Metonet agent will query that network state database to find out the logical topology. So it does a query uh, according to that VM, so it might be a particular tenant. So we'll find out all the information relevant for that tenant's topology network and where it's going to. It's, let's say it's the egress um, destination VM. So once it pulls that information down, the local agent does all of the routing decisions or any type of packet manipulation that needs to happen. So we call this basically the, the packet simulation of that VM as if it's traversing the tenant network until it reaches that destination VM. So that packet hasn't even left the host and it's um, pretended to be simulating through this tenant um, logical network and the packet's manipulated and basically, the kernel will be programmed to have that, that uh, flow entry. And then we can build a GRE or a VXLAN tunnel to the destination compute host, and then send that packet along the way. So the destination host will deliver it to the destination VM. So that's, that pull down of the logical topology only happens on the first packets. After that, that logical topology is completely stored locally and cached. And once the, the flow entry is programmed in the kernel, the remaining packets can fly at near line rate to the destination VM. So a similar process would happen if these packets were bound for the external network, except we would be creating GRE or VX LAN tunnels to the external or excuse me, the Metonet gateway nodes. 
And since the agent resides on those agents on, on those nodes as well, any incoming traffic would be treated the same way. So, so part of the beauty of that is implementing like security group firewalls, for example. We can drop traffic as soon as it comes in and protect the underlying network. So let's go sous le capot under the hood a little bit with some of the nitty gritty. So in general, what's happening in this network is on-demand uh, state propagation. So whenever a change is made, a tenant makes a change to their network, let's say through Horizon, these changes are passed on to the network state database, uh, which actually is just Zookeeper under the hood. And the agents and Zookeeper are, are, are in a relationship with a public subscribe model. So basically, whenever a change is implemented, uh, that change gets pushed down to the agents that uh, care about the change. So we're leveraging Zookeeper and just using remote uh, procedure call over TCP and, and relaying that information to the local agents. Sorry. So what happens when the VM sends its first packet? As I mentioned, if the information is not locally stored or cached, we're going to do that query to the, to the database. Um, so what happens is if it's not already configured, we're going to get a kernel flow miss. So when that happens, the kernel is going to send the packet for queuing and processing to user space via Netlink. So Metonet's going to receive that, that Netlink message and then further process the packet. So then, as I mentioned, if Metonet doesn't have it locally stored, it will do that query to the network state database to retrieve the logical topology. From there, when it, once the logical topology is pulled down, all the processing was done locally by the Metonet agent on the host with the virtual layer simulation. And then we install the flow into the kernel. So whether it be a drop or modify or forward of the packet, that will be installed in the kernel at that stage by, by the Metonet agent. So an example, once, once a packet is um, sent to the kernel from a VM, once we match the tuple to, the, to the, that of the packet header, uh, we can basically use the, the um, actions within the kernel to decide on what the rules are that would have happened based on that network simulation. So some examples of that um, flow table entry match that would have corresponding actions would be changing or modifying. Let's say if two tenants are going between two different subnets through a tenant router, for example, we'd be modifying the MAC address to be that of the routers. We would be changing the TTL on the IP header. And then we would actually encapsulate the packet with GRE or VXLAN. So that would be another action to perform. And then, of course, send it over uh, delivery over an IP Ethernet header to the destination VM um, indicated in that header. So what's key here, too, is the GRE key, or the VXLAN VNI ID, is actually the indicator for the destination host on which vPort to deliver that packet. So once that packet is delivered using this network overlay, the destination VM, or sorry, excuse me, the destination host is aware of the virtual port associated to the destination VM, and it's indicated by that GRE key, or the VXLAN VNI. So talking about some of the benefits of a distributed architecture and some of the differentiators we have that are implemented, our, one is our distributed BGP gateway. So some really cool things that we're doing is implementing BGP to ingress and egress the, the virtualized environment. So using um, basically this well-known protocol, obviously, allows us to easily insert into existing environments um, and get off and going with an HA available protocol um, this is easily implemented with physical boxes today that are all doing standard BGP. Uh, what's cool is you can basically put out x86 boxes as you need to increase the bandwidth you need in and out of your network, and each one will act as a BGP gateway. 
So basically, you can provide your bandwidth on demand and scale out that way. And all the links will be active. So it's not acting in an active standby pair. Um, it's not just active, active, limited to two links. You can keep scaling out as long as those BGP gateways are available on the underlay uh, through your IP network. And just using ECMP will pick uh, a gateway to traverse and exit the ne network that way. So all of the uplinks are active. And then, of course, using these standard-based protocols allows us to implement easily into existing environments. So what's cool about this also is a lot of hardware vendors struggle to just create a logical chassis for routing. And here we are creating uh, a logical provider router to implement these uplinks in an HA solution in a quite easily implemented um, configuration, which I'll show next. So here on the left-hand side, I'm depicting more of like the physical uh, implementation. So what you can do is basically you would be installing our agent on each of the nodes, have them interconnected with an IP fabric, that meaning just a layer three clause underneath, keep it simple. And then our BGP gateways, which you can continue to build out based on the demands uh, of the network. So what this tra translates to in our Metonet's logical topology is from an operator perspective, we're implementing, as I mentioned earlier, that provider router. So with multiple links um, coming off of these BGP gateways, that equates to multiple um, egress points on this provider router. So you can just create these ports and associate them with BGP peers on, up, on the upstream, and you have that on-demand bandwidth and egress points. So from the, the tenant's perspective, that's just added bonus, an HA solution that can scale out um, and allow, allow the tenants and the operator to provide a service with um, dynamic routing and uh, an HA scalable solution. So as I mentioned, it's pretty simple to uh, set up with the provider router. So this is an example of our Metonet CLI. So you can just list the provider, list the routers on the network just to obtain the router ID. Then you simply just add a port. This is really similar to hardware networking. Just add a port with an interface on it. A slash 30 here would represent a point-to-point -point link that you might want to do. And then because we are dealing with the virtualized, we have to, we have to map from virtualized to uh, the physical network. We just create a binding of that specific port that we just made with that IP interface, and we bind it to a physical NIC. So in this case, it would be uh, ETH1. Finally, just like in network, uh, hardware networking, you know, you gotta, if you've got to turn on the protocol, you've you got to do something to do it. So here we add BGP to that specific IP interface. Uh, we give it a local AS number. We indicate the remote AS and, and the BGP peer. And as simple as that, you can get your BGP peering session up and running uh, with an upstream box. And then the last line, the last configuration is simply just sh telling BGP which subnet to advertise. So in this case, it would likely be, in an open stack Metonet environment, it would likely be your floating IP pool. Uh, IP pool. So another example of, uh, of a distributed architecture that's beneficial for a network function is a distributed flow state. So our Metonet's distributed architecture enables the flow states to be processed locally. So there's no query to a network state database um, or a centralized controller, for example, to, to keep track of connection tracking, for example. So um, the one tricky thing here is uh, the ingress and egress points of a flow may vary. So what we do is basically give hints to these interested sets of nodes, the ones that are highly likely to be the ingress points or egress points of these types of flows. So there's several advantages. Obviously, it's a lower latency since we don't have to do a query to, or we don't have to f force the traffic to a particular controller um, or anything that's processing connection tracking, for example. So we get that lower latency, as well as pure independence from a centralized transaction like that. So no query to the network state database or um, a, a service node that might be taking care of that. 
because it's all done locally. So how do we do that? Let's say a new flow is coming in and requires uh, um, the flow state to be tracked. So first we check the local states, if it exists on, on the local box. If it doesn't, we create it. And from there, we forward on the, the state towards other interested nodes. That means other potential ingress nodes or egress nodes for this flow. And then we tunnel the traffic and pass on the packet to deliver it to its destination. So this flow state would be represented by the flow computation, as I mentioned earlier, like a packet simulation and tracking, and then the tunnel encapsulation. So what's key here is we're using specific or specially defined tunnel keys within the GRE header to propagate that flow state to those other nodes. So that's how they, they find out about the flow state. We're basically using a fire and forget state propagations, which means we're not waiting for a confirmation for those other interested nodes. We just send it with the flow state and then we send the packet with no delay. So what happens when, so the knowledge being spread that, like that to other interested nodes means that we can account for asymmetrical um, traffic flows and relay the traffic on without delaying the packet. So within MetoNet, this is simply done by creating these port groups. So we define a port group, we simply give it a name and say, set the stateful uh, parameter to true. And then we just add the ports that would be consistent with the potential same interests to this port group. So in this example, we might add all uplinks from the provider router to, to one port group because they would likely have these incoming packets um, from any direction, depending on how they, they got routed uh, from the external network. Another example might be load balancing for the egress points. You might put all those, all the, all the hosts from a pool in the same port group. So those are some of the advantages that you could, we can get uh, with this distributed architecture. Distributed software. So what I mean by that is we actually went open source yesterday. So we're really excited about it. I don't know if you've heard, but this means you can go and grab our software and try it out today. So we got a new logo. If you're familiar, this is our MetoNet, uh, this is our MetoKura Enterprise MetoNet uh, logo. So that was our original logo, but now this is the one representing our open source community. So we're Apache 2 licensed. Um, we consider ourselves you know, the most highly available, reliable, and stable since we've been in pretty mature um, network virtualization overlay being in the works of three years. Uh, and now this functionality is available to you for you to try out yourself and see for yourself. So there's a lower barrier for you to try out our products. And we just launched yesterday. So these are our original members of our community. So we're grateful for their support and we continue to work with them. Um, we're very vendor neutral, so we consider ourselves very um, open uh, compared to some of the alternative solutions. So now we're truly defining that um, by outright stating that we're now open source. So we'd love for you to try our product. Um, we would love for you to contribute and join the community. So you can check out our metonet.org website and sign up for yourself, download the code yourself, get involved in our community on the IRC chats. Um, my colleagues and I are going to be there to support you guys so, any, so that your learning curve can be much shorter and get you up and running as quickly as possible. So we encourage you to uh, get on there. And so there's a little legal document to sign and you'll, you'll have the support of our team uh, when you're trying it out. So that being said, just a reminder of our enterprise products, as well as now our newly launched open source code available to you. We're on Twitter. We're actually having a launch party tonight, so you're all welcome to come. Please come. Uh, I think we're starting at 5, is that right? 5 o'clock? So 5 o'clock, uh, just across the street here, very close, so please feel free to come by. It's at Le Sou. Uh, so we'll be there celebrating, and I, I thank you for your time today. Hope you guys uh, try us out. <laughs> A 
Are there any questions? Did you want a mic? Oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Yep. When you're scaling out your gateway router at the end, how does it do the the load balancing? Is it like a hash based, or is it round robin, or so we're is just it doing? Yeah, we're doing ECMP basically. So it's just round robin from the choice of the ingress point. So every scaled out provider router has, is a new BGP peer to the external. To the external. To the external, like every. So we make that, we make that uh, decision on which gateway to use right at the ingress point. So it would be right at the, the virtual machine, uh, the host level. So, we'll, so when a VM is initiating a traffic flow, mm -hmm. um, before it even leaves its own host, it will decide on which gateway to use in a round robin fashion. I guess which, which, provider, which of those gateway routers does it choose to use? Just round robin. It will go through all of them. OK. OK. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you say uh, that thing getting open source. Uh, what governance model is for the project? Who decide on upstream? And what is the relationship between enterprise and open source models? Thank right. you. Yeah, so to start, um, the, the Mirokura team will be governing. Um, we expect it to flourish and, and then let the community decide on how it's further governed in the future. Um, so just as an initial start, we, we, the Mirokura team will be governing it. Um, and the second question, so right now, about, we have, we're using our stable code base um, as the released product. So it's basically version 1.8. It's the latest version of our code. Um, so from there, we expect there to be contributions, and the Mironet, Mirokura Enterprise Mironet will take its own stream where it's hardened with QA. Um, it's going to be fully supported. So those are some of the differences between the enterprise version and, and the Mironet version, the open source Mironet version. Thank you. OK, thank you. Yeah, do, yep. Um, when we're doing these overlays, are you expecting the OSs to be downgraded on their MTU to handle the um, increased size of the overlay, or are you expecting to do jumbo frames? And if you're expecting to use jumbo frames, what do you expect all those settings to accumulate to? Uh, because jumbo frames is not actually a, a finite number, it's actually a variable. Right, so as long as, as, long as the plumbing in between for the, the underlay, um, as long as the MTUs match the whole way through, and account for that header. So, so the, the MTU on the actual VMs, VNIC, should be smaller. But as long as, as, long as the, the MTU from end to end accounts for the header, then you should be fine, whether it be a standard Ethernet packet or a jumbo frame. OK. So do I have to go through my entire corporation, change all desktops, all database servers down in MTU? so that they can interoperate with you? Is that your intent? So, so for desktops, are you talking more like a, the VDI solution? Well, no, but if anybody's going to talk to this environment, yeah. and if you're um, having a MTU issue, I'm going to have to downgrade my entire corporation so the packets can go in and out uh, without fragmentation. Uh, right. Or I'm going to have to, for this one um, overlay network, all those switches are going to have to be set to an MTU value um, in a jumbo frame range to be able to handle the overhead. Right. So just where the virtualized, just where the overhead is um, implemented, that's where you would need to increase your MTU. So you wouldn't be needing to do it on your physical network or your, your physical endpoints. You would just be needing to do it where it ingresses into the virtualized environment to account for the header. One more question, sorry. Yeah. Your okay. example had a, you're doing eBGP between the, yep. is, is it just only, EB, only eBGP supported or can you do iBGP and what are all the, is it like a full feature support for BGP or is it just a subset? Can you talk about that some more? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, today we're ju just doing eBGP. So um, you can easily just use a private AS, right? Like a reserved AS or something. Um, so we're not implementing to the full extent of like MPBGP and those like those types of things, but it's more for the sake of advertising routes in a dynamic fashion. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for your time. Again, hope to see you tonight at our launch party, and feel free to stop by our booth as well.
or in the, the startup area. So thanks, thanks everyone. Merci.